Hello and welcome to Better at Home. My name is Miriam. Thank you for joining us today. Our author talk this week is with Gareth Powell. Gareth Powell is an award-winning science fiction writer. Um, books including, well, I have here, Embers of War, this is part of a trilogy um, which has gone into early production to be a TV series. So amongst other things, um, Gareth is going to be a co-executive producer of that. Um, Gareth has written novellas, um, short stories and a non-fiction book about writing. Um, so lots to talk about this evening. Thank you for joining us, Gareth. Hi. Hello. Um, can we start off with talking about uh, your writing journey and how you really became to be a, a writer? Um, what was it that, that kind of began that journey? Well, it's something I always wanted to do um, back as, as far as I can remember. I used to, <clears throat> I used to make um, little books by sort of folding several pieces of A4 in half and stapling them and then writing a story in it and drawing pictures. So I remember one about a, a knight who found um, a dragon's egg and it hatched and he, he had a pet dragon called Spikey. Um, you know, so it, it was always something I thought would be a good thing to do but it was something I never thought would be a realistic thing to do um, I studied um, humanities at, uh, at university and part of the course was a creative writing course for three years but mm, I kind of came out of that and I had to get a, a job in a call centre to earn some money and, and stuff like that and it never felt like that would be something that would ever properly take off so I, I, I wrote the odd short story and some really terrible poetry um and some bits and bobs um but then when I got to um approaching the turn of the millennium I was also approaching my 30th birthday so I thought it was time to you know to really get if I was going to do it now was the time so I spent two years writing um a novel which became my first novel Silver Sands um while working a 40 hour week in software marketing and uh, then I started I put that in a cupboard and started writing short stories and eventually started getting picked up by magazines and, and it all led from there really. Okay because you had some quite inspiring early writing mentors didn't you including Diane Wynne Jones was one of them? Yeah I was very fortunate when I was in the sixth form at school that my English teacher put uh, something I'd written forward for a competition and the prize was to meet Diana Wynne-Jones in the watershed upstairs bar and have a cup of coffee mm. uh, which seemed terribly grown up at that time and uh, she kind of went through my story and told me why it was terrible and all the different places where it was really terrible. Um, I've still got the notes she wrote somewhere um, but that was amazing, you know, the, to, to get that that level of feedback, which from when you're at school, English teachers just reward you for using the long words, uh, whereas she was talking about style and brevity and all these kind of completely alien concepts. So, yeah, I was very fortunate to uh, have met her when I did, really. So when did you start writing science fiction? Was that something that you had read a lot of um yourself or as a young person why did you kind of go head towards that genre well I, I started writing science fiction when I was about four or five years old because um my earliest memories are of watching Star Trek on an old black and white tv in the early 70s um I think it was the first time they showed it in the UK maybe um and I was obsessed with that and then obviously um 76 or 77 Star Wars came out and that was all anybody talked about and uh, you know I, I've been a goner ever since so I went to the local you know our local library had a huge science fiction section so I pretty much read my way through that as a child and um, so it's kind of my first love and as I say when I studied at university they wouldn't entertain the idea of that terrible science fiction stuff there so I had to try and write literary fiction and really wasn't into it and um so as soon as I, I left uni I kind of gave a metaphorical two fingers to uh to that and, and started writing sci-fi stories so 
It's, it's, it's interesting that kind of people have quite strong views about science fiction. I think either way, they either com- completely love it, you've got you know, a complete fan of it, or um, it's a kind of recoil at, um, at the thought of it. Why, why do you think that is? I think it has an image problem that people still see it as a kind of nerdy boys literature in the, the way it was in kind of like the 1950s, all sort of Buck Rogers and Ray Guns and things. Whereas as today, I mean, there are, there are some incredible um, authors and um, I don't know the exact stats, but a, load of, a lot of my favourite authors writing at the moment are, are women and they um, are producing some incredible um, diverse stories, um, diverse uh, sort of casts and sexualities and, and um, it's really pushing the edge of what literature can be at the moment because for me mainstream literature is kind of hobbled slightly by um uh, by having to to sort of not just use the whole of time and space as a a playground so i think that's why a lot of mainstream literature is shading into these fantasy areas now Mm. which is i think um victoria schwab um, he's a fantasy novelist, but she's just having a great crossover success at the moment with The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, which is a, about a girl who who lives for um, centuries, but nobody ever remembers her. Mm. And it's that, so it, it, it's, you know, it's a straight out fantasy novel, but it's being, it's crossing over because it has that sort of mainstream appeal because people need, especially in times like these, mm. people need to talk about different worlds people need to talk about nobody wants to read 600 pages about covid for goodness yes. sake do they and it's you know we you know and uh, it's it, it allows you to play with ideas you can't play with in other fiction so you know for for instance trump um he came on the scene and everyone's immediately saying oh look it's like the hunger games or it's like this it's like that because authors had taken that idea and said, well, what would happen if a crazy dictator got into blah, blah, blah. And so we can kind of examine the news and the headlines through the lens of science fiction as a kind of, um, you know, we said, well, you know, what happens if, you know, all these drones they're using, well, what happens if, and and you go on and on, you get Terminator or whatever. But it's just a fantastic literature for playing with and exploring ideas. Yes, sir. One one of the things I was going to ask was how um, what do you think science fiction brings to a reader, particularly in these like you've just mentioned in these challenging times um, when obviously there's, there's so much going on which almost feels like um, the realms of, of kind of science fiction. What what do you think it, it brings to a reader, and how do you think the pandemic is going to have an effect on science fiction writing in in the future? Do you think it will um, have an effect on it? I think at the moment, if you look at um, Netflix and the other big providers, like there's a huge amount of sci-fi on the TV at the moment, from the, like the Mandalorian, um, the new Star Trek Discovery series. There's um, uh, there's, there's uh, just tons of them, and because people are looking for escape, mm. and they're looking for a bit of escapism, but they're also looking for something different and something a bit more interesting than, you know, you can get on EastEnders or what have you, something you can get your teeth into. Mm. Um, you know, Game of Thrones was huge, I think, for that reason as well. You know, it's, it's the hunger for that has, has been there for, for many years, but it's it's not crossing over into books so much because people think, well, oh, I, I'm not into that silly sci-fi stuff, but, uh, oh, yes, I love watching Star Wars. Um but they wouldn't read it because it's too nerdy to read it. Whereas, you know, so that there is that kind of um, mm. disconnect. But I think with Game of Thrones, that kind of caused the books to be selling huge numbers. Yes. And I think uh, with the the Expanse series as well by James S. A. Corey, that mm. those books are doing fantastically because they're coming out as the TV series is coming out. So mm. there, there obviously is a hunger for sci-fi in the the viewing public and it's getting that to translate into the reading public as well Mm, definitely do you think there's something quite reassuring about it i think there's something quite reassuring about science fiction that no matter how kind of um confusing the present feels like even if it's in 
um, in a story form that there is some kind of future beyond whatever it is that you're kind of going through um, at the present. Um, and no matter how kind of complicated that seems, if you're managing to sort it out <laughs> somehow. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there might, do you think it's possibly something reassuring about that? There is a kind of reassurance to the fact that we will get through our current mess, mm. you know, and, and we're not living in the end of days um, and there will be, you know, more to come. Um, mm. It's like as the Roman Empire was kind of grinding down, it was they, they were telling the stories of the gods and the heroes and, the, mm. you know, the, you know, Odysseus and his, his that's not, uh, is that Greek? That's Greek. I'm getting my empires muddled up again. But um yeah, so I mean, we humans always think that, that we're living kind of in the end of days and everything will be worse after us. And, you know, après moi la deluge. And um, the sci fi is just, you know, it's, it's saying we'll get through our current rubbish. And, and this is how it might have affected how we will have developed, but we will get through. Um, and there is more out there than just the earth because, you know, in Victorian times, people were telling stories uh, about sailors go off and exploring unexplored lands full of wild creatures and, and you know, stra strange inhabitants um, because the, you know, there was all the, the, the huge uh, British merchant navy going around the world. Mm. Um, and we've kind of lost that now because you go off to an unexplored land and you find it's full of Australian backpackers. Mm. And so instead we have these different worlds and there's you know there's endless endless worlds out there so mm -hmm. there's endless space to imagine anything that you want with with that in mind thinking about the endless endless world when you're writing um science fiction obviously you've got you're creating um new worlds and not just new worlds you're creating new universes really um so where do you begin when you're writing or when you're about to start writing um one of your novels where do you begin with that um kind of creative process what what do you start with i i will usually start with kind of a vague idea for a story hmm. and a idea for a character and I will kind of build everything else from there. So I'll kind of, I'll build the character. I think, well, how did they get to be how they are? How did they get to be where they are? And what, what would need to be in place for that to have happened? And um, and I'll have some idea of the story. So if it, for instance, involves some, you know, planet-sized computer that they've discovered, or how did that get there? And who built that? And where did that come from? And how do they get from Earth to it? So how does, you know... Um, what power does the spaceship use so that you know if the spaceship has very very cheap fusion power then there won't be an energy crisis on the earth because everyone else will have really cheap fusion power as well so that kind of it builds out in layers so you start with um what uh you start with what you want to happen and who you want to be there and then you have to justify why they're there and how they got there mm -hmm. um it, it, it's something you, you uh in fantasy for instance i mentioned game of thrones if you have a castle mm -hmm. that your heroes all live in a castle where does the food come from mm -hmm. so you have to have a village around it and farmers and fa so you have to have some way of the farmers kind of contributing to them so you have to say well they they how they um they have pay tax or whatever and so you have to come up with this whole arrangement for how that works just mm -hmm. to say how do they how do they eat so yeah, that's that's a lot, yeah, isn't it? That's a lot to kind of think about. I mean, do you, do you keep notes? Do you have copious amounts of kind of? I have. I, I have history. I have some notes. Um, some things I just hint at, so I don't explain too greatly. As I, I just hint at them, um, and leave you know things for the reader to fill in. Um, but yeah, it's you. You have to. You have to think through the implications as well. So, because if you have a spaceship that can go from A to B instantly, mm. then what effect would that have on society? If you could just zip up, drop a bomb on someone and zip off again, mm. then how can anyone defend themselves against anything? And how would, you know, um, so you have to put limits. Um, so if you want your characters caged in the spaceship interacting for two chapters, you have to say, well, it's going to, that's because the spaceship can only go a certain speed, hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if you want your 
um if you want like a, a, a group of planets set up like a, a sort of victorian empire where with sailing ships going between them so that journeys take a long time then you have to mm-hmm. um whereas if you just want ones where you you, you know, sort of press a button and walk through a little door and you're you're 10,000 light years away then that would also have huge implications it's you can let your mind go absolutely wild with um ideas but you have to then bring those ideas back and say how do they affect the characters because it's the characters who are for me the main most important part of the story Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so how much of of your science fiction is science fact how much kind of uh, scientific basis do you have to have I mean so does a lot of research you have to have a lot of research or is it not um I I tend to write um stuff set quite a long way in the future Mm -hmm. so I can get away with a bit more sort of fudging of how things work as long as I you know as long as I don't do anything that sort of contradicts sort of basic um astronomy like um you know so if I've got the planets going in a certain way they behave in a certain way gravity behaves in a certain way and blah 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 so as long as i make it plausible then it's not too bad there are some writers who who write much more um sort of close to the present day science mm-hmm. fiction sort of 10 or 20 years out and they have to keep on top of everything because you know they it can take two years to write a book and suddenly what you were writing about can have come true by the time you finished writing it so it's um that that can be quite difficult um and you have to put a lot of research into that so um i, I i'm more interested in, in sort of the uh, the adventure and the characters than the, the nuts and bolts everything works okay i'm gonna bring in i'm going to bring in embers of embers of war the first obviously that's, that's the first one in the trilogy um can you tell us a bit more about kind of the story of, of Embers of War and, and the books? Oh, I think I might have frozen a bit there. Sorry. Did I freeze there? Okay. I'll just, I'll just repeat that question. Um, I'm going to bring in kind of Embers, Embers of War um, and just ask you to explain a bit more about, about the story and a bit more about the trilogy. Sure. Well, it's... Um basically set uh, around a former warship uh, called the Trouble Dog, who took part in a, a, a war crime and was so disgusted with her behaviour, uh, she accidentally grew a conscience, mm. which, because um, obviously you don't want warships with consciences because they would start to question their orders. But she, um, she accidentally started to grow a conscience. And so she left. She mm. resigned had her weapons taken away and uh, and uh, walked out basically and she joined a humanitarian rescue organization um, and became sort of like a, an ambulance um, and she is because kind of, her mind is is made is computerized but it's also based on some cloned human cells with some dog DNA in there to inspire loyalty and pack behavior so she's basically a 14 year old girl in the guise of a missile she's a a weapon but she's trying to be good but she doesn't really know how to be um so she's a very conflicted character and and throughout the book sometimes she she's trying to better herself and other times she just gets cross and wants to vaporize something um so she's she's kind of trying she's like a, a teenager trying to find her place in the world and trying to find out you know everybody else seems to know how to act and how do i act and who who am i going to be and she's got a, a crew of um of misfits who are all have all been affected by the war that's that's just finished and they're all uh, in one way or another and they're all trying to come to terms with who they are now and uh, what they've done in the past and they go off on a rescue mission and they get into some trouble um which i won't give away too much but they um they start to unravel a conspiracy that has much wider implications throughout the trilogy and um, we just found out in the last couple of weeks that it's, it's in early productions to be a TV series. Um, how does that feel for you? Uh, it feels feels very strange. I mean, I I kind of knew about this 18 months ago, so I've had to keep my mouth shut for 18 months, which has been really, really hard. But um, now the news is out there. There's um, a director attached uh, mm. who's, 
who's Breck Eisner, who directed a lot of episodes of The Expanse, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So he knows his space onions, really. He, he, and the, the script writer, Gary Graham, is, is produced a fantastic pilot script. So I'm just really, really excited. But part of me won't believe it until I actually see it on the TV. So Yes, it must be quite quite something to see or to imagine seeing your characters kind of come to come to life really I mean obviously they've been yeah. alive in, in your heads and on, on on the page and also um in the kind of the minds of your readers as well I suppose there's an expectation there about um what those characters are going to, to be like so how much input obviously it's your book but how much input do you actually have into um what I have a kind of um a, a consultancy role mm -hmm. um on the on the thing and I, I think I'm credited as co-executive producer but the uh, Gary the scriptwriter, um, is basically doing the the adaptation so I'm not looking over his shoulder and saying no you can't do this you can't do that mm -hmm. um, so he's he's interpreting it for the screen because that's that's what he's good at that's his job so okay um, and do we know when that do we know when that's coming out or can we not say when that's uh, do we know when we should hope to see it on the screen we're currently waiting for a network to pick it up okay so, yeah. Okay, amazing, Leah. Our time is almost coming to an end, but what, what else have you um, got coming up um, over the year? Well, this, uh, this year in April, um, Solaris Books are releasing a special 10th anniversary edition of my novel, The Recollection, um, which has got a nice brand new cover and I've written a new introduction for it. So, so that will be nice. I was always very fond of that book and, and um, it would be nice to, to kind of see it picking up some new readers again mm -hmm. and then in august um the uh, there's a book called light chaser which i co-wrote with peter f hamilton um mm -hmm. and that will be coming out from tour.com mm -hmm. okay fantastic i'm going to hold up embers of war again just um for those people, if you want to get ahead of the game, <laughs> ahead of um, it being on TV at some point in the future, um, Embers of Wars Trilogy by Gareth Powell um, is published by Titan Books. Also, um, I do recommend following Gareth on Twitter um, and signing up because you've got a very good um, kind of newsletter as well, Gareth, that tells people what you're up to, haven't you, as well? Yeah, um, you can find it. You sign up for that. You can find links to all that on my website, which is www.garethlpowell.com. Fantastic. Gareth, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we look forward uh, to seeing Embers of War in the future and also um, more writing from you as well. Thank you very much.